a global network of diverse experts all working to advance science and its application to the legal system, converging in Colorado for the American Academy of Forensic Sciences annual conference. And we're covering every angle. This is AAFS TV. Welcome back to the Mile High City. I'm Molly Hendrickson, taking you through four fascinating days of forensic science education and expertise. Today we turn to the Academy and all the ways they're working for you. From membership to mentorship. It goes to building personal relationships as well. There are other people who are at the same level in their career as you are. They have the same questions, so why not grow together? The opportunities for professional development and career advancement are endless. An innovative way to protect those who serve. We'll take you to a lab making sure toxicologists aren't unknowingly exposed to deadly drugs. It's a thrilling third day ahead and there are plenty of ways to watch. You can find the latest AAFS TV episodes on the TVs placed throughout the convention center. On channel 66 in your room at the Hyatt Regency. On the AAFS meeting homepage and the meeting app. and on our YouTube and X pages. With more than 6,500 members from all around the globe, the multidisciplinary scientific membership of AAFS provides extensive and diverse opportunities for growth. Zain Balu is here now with more on the benefits of being a member. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. So let's start with some of those benefits. What would you say are some of the top advantages for becoming a member of AAFS? Oh, well, well uh, I think you'd first start with uh, I guess generically opportunity. Uh, you know, there's there's a couple of different member levels. So there's a whole lot of opportunities across each one of the uh, membership levels. And with 12 sections with which to interact with each and every one of those membership levels, uh, there's opportunity to give back at every level. There's opportunity to grow at every level. There's opportunity to learn and grow and, you know, be the best person, be the best version of yourself that you can, because you can give back at a student level, you can give back at an academic level, you can give back at a member level, and there's lots of opportunity to make sure that you make this the best experience for you and, and you know everyone in your section as well. So. And you mentioned growth. How much does AAFS help with professional growth and development? Oh, it, again, it goes down right down to the uh, sort of to the grassroots level, right to the bottom. I mean, you know, with respect to student, uh, the student affiliates and the trainee affiliates, uh, we have what's called the uh, Young Forensic Scientist Forum. So, um, they provide quality programming in a sense to young members at the beginning and middle of their careers, such that if they need help with professional development, uh, personal development, anything academic or career-wise, uh, we provide resume building, you know, workshops, uh, training for interviewing skills, and you know th that that kind of stuff. After that, we could talk about the student academy. They provide uh, students in the you know the the surrounding areas with um, access to the very different sections here to get a better understanding of what forensics is and what they could do and you know what their their possibilities are. Um, after that, you know it, it goes to the uh, the academy mentorship program. Um, I'm, I'm the co-chair of the uh, academy mentorship program, and it's it's in its fledgling uh, fledgling years, but we've already made pairings. We've already made mentor and mentee relationships. Um, they go beyond just you know meeting with somebody who's at a higher level in their career and sort of who you aspire to be. It goes to building personal relationships as well. There are other people who are at the same level in their career as you are. They have the same questions, so why not grow together? Uh, and then it goes right all the way up to members. We're providing members with you know ever-changing benefits to becoming a member, to grow within the academy, to become from associate member to member, from member to fellow. And I'm also on the membership outreach ad hoc committee, which is whose sole goal is is to so the membership outreach committee is their sole goal is to provide better and growing uh, benefits to members. Why is it better to become a member? Here's why. What are we doing to members? What are we doing for members? And what are we hoping that they're going to give back to the academy because they're they've got so much opportunity. So you're giving people all these tools. You're somebody who's taken advantage of everything this has to offer. Can you talk a little bit about your career trajectory? Sure. Uh, well, professionally and personally, I started out in desktop publishing and worked my way into forensics. I knew this is where I wanted to be, so I took every opportunity that I could, said yes to probably more than I should have, but took every <laughs> opportunity that, I, that, that, that came my way. Um, within the academy, I started off as a trainee, stayed at a trainee, became associate member. Now I've just been voted in at this meeting as a full member, and hopefully in the near future I'll be moving up to fellow. But I think the most important thing for that and for anybody is 
you know, nobody owes you anything. If you want it, you got to go get it. And the American Academy provides you with so many opportunities to be able to capitalize on those opportunities. And you only get out what you put in. So mm -hmm. my advice to everybody would be to put in as much as you can because what you'll get out is definitely worth it. Yeah, it sounds like you've taken advantage of everything it has to offer. Uh, what would be your favorite part of being a member? Uh, I think the community. I think uh, there's, again, so much opportunity at different levels for the community. You have the you know, the younger the younger crowd that provides you with a certain level of community, then there's the people in your section who are more seasoned and have more experience and more to more to advise you. But I definitely love coming to the meetings. They're definitely, a, you know, a highlight to be able to see all the people again. And um, where I was trained, you know, it's, it's nice to be doing all the reading, but this part of it, the interaction with subject matter experts in your field and other field gives you so much more than just reading a book could so I think uh, that's that's definitely a good good opportunity uh, the opportunity to give back I think is one of my favorites as well I've I'm on several different committees I plan to keep that going if I possibly can and uh, to be of service I mean I think it's I think it's really really important to give back and I tried to do my best for the uh, young forensic scientists forum to do as much as we could for the young the young scientists and I think I'd like to keep that going with the Academy Mentorship Program as well as you know anything involving just our individual question document section. Absolutely. Well thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. When it comes to the future of outdoor forensic anthropology, a body farm is one of the most critical tools at researchers' disposal. Melissa Connor serves as director of the Forensic Investigation Research Station at Colorado Mesa University and is here now in studio. Thank you so much. Glad to have you here with us. Thank you for having me, Molly. So first, what got you into forensic science? I started out as an archaeologist and I was working in a place called Little Bighorn doing battlefield work, battlefield archaeology. And a gentleman named Clyde Snow, who's a forensic anthropologist, came up to help us work on the remains that we exhumed. And he said, you guys have to take this to a real battlefield. So he got, um, he worked with a group called Physicians for Human Rights. They got the contract to go into Croatia in 1993. And he said, you guys come over and do the same thing you were doing there on our sites. And we started doing uh, the mapping, the cartridge case analysis, and the body exhumation. He brought along some of the members of the Argentine forensic team because they were really good at body exhumations. And then I worked with Physicians for Human Rights off and on for another couple of decades and um, became a forensic scientist. That's fascinating. You direct a decomposition facility, also known as a body farm. Can you talk a little bit about what you do there? Well, the core of any of our decomp facilities is a willed body program. So people donate their body specifically to us. So we work with donors. We work with funeral homes when those donors die to bring them to us. Then we take the bodies and depending on the research that we have going on at the time, we may place them outside. We may place them in a car. We may do different things with them, but the majority are placed outside to watch how they decompose. And we can change the macro environment we're kind of stuck with in one given place, but the micro environment, sun, shade, indoor, outdoor, clothing, non-clothing, we can vary that to see what differences those variations make. So people donate their bodies for research, basically. We've all heard about the body farm in Tennessee, but are there others? Yes, so the ones that are outside that macro environment include the facility in Australia, there's a facility in Quebec, Northern Michigan University has one, and then the two facilities at Colorado Mesa University run. Gosh, I'm so curious as to how you even get a facility like that up and running. There's got to be a lot that goes oh, into that. That's another interview. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned Colorado Mesa University has two different research sites, the main facility in Whitewater and then also the one in Park County. Why, why two sites? Well, the facility in Whitewater that we started with is at 5,000 feet. It's in a desert. It's unlike any other facility for those reasons. But we have a lot of mountains in Colorado and the coroners are dealing with a lot of deaths at 9, 10, 11,000 feet. And bodies decay differently. The altitude, the lack of oxygen, the la humidity, the lack of humidity, 
all impact what goes on in the decay process. And that's before we even get to the difference in the scavenger guilds and what will eat a body. So um, what we're doing is doing kind of a compare and contrast. We've got a woman named Christiane Bajent doing her dissertation on that um, 10,000 foot body farm. And we work in concert with the Park County Coroner, David Kintz. Uh, and he does a lot of the administrative work with us so that we can keep an eye on it. Fascinating stuff. I could talk to you all day about this stuff, but we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us, Melissa. Thank you. Turning now to an incredible new way to protect public servants, the Provincial Toxicology Center in British Columbia. By creating an automated high-performance computing system, this lab is able to rapidly detect novel psychoactive substances, preventing unnecessary loss of life for those performing post-mortem toxicology tests. Let's see how. The Provincial Toxicology Center is the clinical reference lab for toxicology testing in the province of BC. We've learned through the past few years that the drug supply is unpredictable. The number of deaths that occur as a result of the drug supply is very unpredictable and it's really necessary to be fluid with, with our operations. To that end, I've been working with federal partners to collaborate with other labs to try to streamline the process, ensure that we have better communication and uh, intelligence shared between different jurisdictions. Right now, we have the ability to look for drugs that we know about, that have already been characterized. The next step is to try to predict what drugs might come out in the future. In 2020, the Mentorship Ad Hoc Committee released a survey showing most members would be thrilled to have a mentor to guide them through their professional development and career opportunities. Gina Landina Smoller is here in studio now to explain how the Academy is taking that feedback and putting it into action. Gina, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So let's go back to that survey. The overwhelming response from people was that they wanted mentorships. Yeah, so we surveyed the membership of AFS and we had hundreds of people that were interested not only in being a mentor but also being a mentee and having some type of guidance and, and support. And so because of that, we really decided as a group that we needed to push this program forward and figure out how to get those mentors and mentees matched up. And why do you think people place such an emphasis on the mentorship program? I mean, so as a new professional going into your career, it's really helpful to get some type of support, get resources, get guidance that you might not have in your own institution or organization, right? And so um, being able to have others that have similar interests in you, whether it's your discipline, your area, your aspirations, mm -hmm. your professional goals, um, that's really important um, to be successful in your job and in your profession. And for people who are watching this and maybe wanna become a mentor, what do you guys look for in your mentors and um, to become a part of this program? Yeah, so we're definitely going to reach out to the members to see if they wanna continue this participation. Um, but really we're looking for everyone, anyone that is in, in all disciplines, in all sections, has a wide variety of experience. Um, but we need to make sure that those mentors also um, want to be involved and want to have that connection with a mentee, right? And that they are reachable and will give them feedback and return their, their questions and things like that. It's clear how mentorships help the mentee. How would you say that they also help the profession? If you are siloed and you're only in your city or your town or your institutional organization, wherever it is that you work, you're not getting ideas and information from anywhere else, right? And there might be answers to your questions. There might be better ways to doing science or um, other resources that you don't even know exist, right? You don't know what you don't know. And having um, and being a part of a mentor program really allows that individual to branch out and learn new things and um, find new ways. And, and that's, I think, what's so powerful about this program. 
learn new things and also make new connections in an industry that they love, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. What has been kind of the feedback on the program? So um, just this morning, we um, kicked off another one of our mentor mentee breakfasts. Um, we actually had people that was signed up during registration if they were interested in participating. And we had, you know, probably about a hundred people that attended and got paired them up and you know I think that there is definitely a need for this and there's definitely interest and so hopefully we'll be able to continue to make this program grow. And what about you personally? Do you have a specific mentor that helped you along your path and helped shape your career? Yeah and I of course right we all have mentors or people that really influenced us and guided us and helped us and I think one of the things that was really amazing for me as a young educator right I'm a professor and didn't only knew my department didn't really know anyone else in other schools and finally people I reached out to others in other schools and areas and said how did you get to do what you are doing because I this is what I like and um, it takes a little bit of courage to do mm -hmm. that and to reach out um, and the same thing with um, coming to the the academy right like I started going to my general section business meeting meeting the leaders talking to them trying to meet people and network and so I've definitely had people in my life that have helped me and um, I think have really made me successful in, in what I do. Yeah, it's pretty incredible once you start putting that energy out there, how mm -hmm. much of it comes back to you and yeah. the help that you need. So thank you so much for joining us and taking the time to talk to us sure, today. Thanks for having me. Now we wanted to hear directly from our members. We talked with attendees asking the question, how has the AAFS helped you further your career? So many ways, um, one of the major ways is connection, that is networking. Um, through AAFS membership, I've been able to climb up the career by um, lab recitations and um, civil reviews and job placement. I actually got my first job on the notice board of AAFS. I think it's awesome to just get an opportunity to meet all these other awesome people in the industry and um, see presentations by experts and learn new things. It's helping me to know some techniques of analysis of size drugs because I work in uh, size drug material and I knew some new psychoactive active drugs like cannabinoids and it's very interesting to know how do you analyze it. Well, I'm relatively new to forensic odontology, so it's allowed me to meet other people in my field, um, see the research that's being done, what we still need to improve on, and just get a sense of community within my field. The University of North Dakota's Forensic Science program is cultivating the next generation of forensic scientists. Equipped with forensic expertise, their graduates are ready to contribute to law enforcement's efforts in fighting crime. The world is full of injustice, so uh, it's important to have the young people that are coming after us passionate, but also living in the reality of our days. The field of forensic science is extremely important. We not only help the criminal justice system determine people that are potentially guilty or of crimes, but also we help prove those that are innocent. The forensic science program is offering four years of bachelor degree in forensic science, and we have three concentrations that the students can choose from, forensic biology, forensic chemistry, and criminal investigations. Right now I'm performing autopsies and that is applying my forensic science degree. That's just one of the cool experiences, cool job opportunities that you can get while you're a student here at the University of North Dakota. The forensic science program serves the criminal justice system and by training our students to be the best in their field, we are just making sure the next generation of forensic scientists get the best training. The goal of the Journal of Forensic Sciences is to advance forensic science research, education, and practice by publishing peer-reviewed manuscripts of the highest quality. Editor-in-Chief Michael Pete is here now in studio to discuss this. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. So to get started, how does the journal strengthen the scientific foundation of forensic science? When people get published, 
that publication, in my view, is a mark of the scientific rigor of that paper. It's been through a peer review process, almost always goes through a revision process, another peer review process. So we have scientifically reviewed that paper and deem it worth publishing. That doesn't mean necessarily in the forensic field that it's legally acceptable. It means it's scientifically acceptable. And increasingly, that's, um, you know, it's a very broad sp spectrum between the two, increasingly. So we obviously provide reviews. As I said, we provide papers for others in the sense that when we publish something, some other scientists can p pick up that paper, work their research project around it. We provide teaching aids because it's in the literature and people can uh, download it, etc. So we provide a lot of aid to the forensic science profession in publishing articles in the journal. And it's all electronic. It went electronic maybe 20 years ago now. So, and that certainly has um, accelerated uh, the acceptance of uh, the Journal of Forensic Science. How does the journal benefit members of the academy? I think it provides a resource to them. It provides a scientific resource. They have access to the articles that are published. They can use those for their own teaching purposes, for their own research purposes. And certainly I think it's, it's appropriate that the academy has a very strong journal. Um, and we encourage people to use it, we encourage people to publish in it. So it's, it's a very strong resource and I think it's uh, a, a vast benefit to the uh, membership. And increasingly it's the basis, the or articles in there are the bases for what's called validation studies. And you read about those in the press sometimes when a case is being tried. And validation studies are really continuing the work published in JFS transferred to somebody's own lab and they have to go through a whole series of studies before it can be presented in court. So what would your advice be to somebody wanting to submit their work for publication? Um, two, well three things actually. I, I think you, you've got to determine how you're going to publish it. We publish papers, we publish technical notes, we publish case reports. Occasionally we publish critical reviews and commentaries. So you first got to th think about where is the audience? What's the audience going to be? If you're adapting a method, it, it could be a technical note because that's the sort of audience that would be reading an adaptation of method. If you're doing a full-blown research study that's uh, by a graduate student, then it will be submitted as a paper. So that's the th first thing. The second thing, would be to make sure you write it in the English language. With all due respect, it's part of uh, what we find very difficult, particularly with people from Asia, uh, Europe, etc. That the, the language doesn't do the article wo any worthy benefit. It's, so they really need to get those things straight before they submit. And then finally, I got to, you've got to have the scientific rigor. If you, if you just submit something you did on the bench on Friday, well, you're probably not going to pass muster. <laughs> so you've got to have the scientific rigor. Yeah. Michael Pete, we certainly appreciate your time today. Thank, thank you. you for joining us. Well, thank you. Focusing on gunshot residue, glass evidence, and physical fit examinations, West Virginia's Department of Forensic and Investigative Science has developed innovative solutions to address these complexities. Through simulated crime scenes and laboratory settings, let's see their insights into the practical applications of their research. The Department of Forensic Science at West Virginia University is one of the leading forensic science programs uh, based on the accomplishments and achievements through research and teaching of students. Trace materials are essential to answer relevant questions to the investigation, like how and when the materials were transferred, where the sample came from, and what may have occurred during the crime. Developments in spectroscopy, laser-based technology, mass spectrometry, and computer science are examples of tools that we use in our research group to enhance law enforcement and forensic laboratories' capabilities. We strive to develop technology that can lead to more cost-effective and faster solutions while increasing the objectivity, reliability, and usage of the data to continue making it available as an inner right of individuals and their families to justice that upholds to the highest quality of science.
The African Forensic Science Academy is a professional representative body for forensic science practitioners in Africa. Dr. Antonel Olker serves as president of the AFSA, or AFSA, and is here to explain a little bit more about the Academy's work. The mission of AFSA is two things, to build a network for forensic science practitioners across Africa, and secondly, forensic science practitioners, their credentials across the continent are not harmonized. So we would like to ar arrive at a point where that is, and so that is also one of our missions. Our resources are in incredibly limited, so therefore we have to find innovative ways to do more with what we actually have. So we are in Africa embracing the concept of frugal forensics, which is an innovative way of maximizing what you have. And so in terms of training, our training programs, as I mentioned, are not harmonized, but it's also a different type of training that is needed. And that is training legal professionals to understand the value that forensic scientists can bring to deliver justice. AFSA is indeed the only organization within Africa that represents all forensic science practitioners in all seven fields and 26 subspecialties that is also officially registered and has independent oversight. This is a big undertaking, but if something is difficult, it doesn't mean that it should not be done. In Africa, we ask ourselves, how do we do this? Well, we decided to take one step at a time, every day take a step, but also make sure that we're walking in the right direction. It's like moving a mountain. How do you do that? Literally one stone at a time. AFSA would like prospective members who want to join us to know that we have four categories the full membership category um, are for forensic scientists with credentials in forensic science and also then a required amount of years of experience, which is currently five. So that is for forensic scientists. If you are not a forensic scientist, but you have an interest or you're promoting forensic science in Africa, you can become an associate member. So that is our effort to include other professionals. Then there are student members, which is self-explanatory, they must be registered. And they can actually study outside, African students studying outside of Africa, or other students studying forensic science within Africa. Important also to note that we have an affiliate membership for organizations who want to promote forensic sciences in Africa. That is our effort to be globally connected and to be very transparent to the rest of the forensic science community in, in what we do. That's a wrap on this third day. From career development to leadership opportunities, we've highlighted all the ways the Academy is working for you. You can find the latest AAFS TV episodes on the TV's place throughout the Convention Center, on the in-house channels at Partner Hotels, on the AAFS Meeting homepage and the Meeting app. and on our YouTube and X pages. Thanks for your time today. We've got our fourth and final day still to come. We're talking trends in technology tomorrow. We'll see you then.